fair amount of oxygen. Interestingly, of course, there's a lot of water vapor and, of course, methane. Now, Mars has a bit of uh, methane in its atmosphere, although I don't know whether that's been confirmed, but there have been reports of it at times in the roundabout apart per billion. That this is, of course, well over a thousand times less than the Earth's uh, methane level. And it has a trace of oxygen. Um, you will always have oxygen in a planetary atmosphere uh, uh, that the sun shines on because both water and carbon dioxide and other oxygen containing gases will dissociate and release some oxygen. So the mere presence of oxygen alone doesn't really tell you anything much at all. An awful lot of it, like on the Earth, should make you suspicious, but it's not prima facie evidence uh, of life. Now, the idea of the Earth regulating its atmospheric composition and climate was discussed in another paper from JPL, this one with Chuck Giffen, an engineer who was building, I think, the first mass spectrometer at JPL. And it was published in that strange journal, which nobody references, called the uh, Journal of the American Astronautical Society. Uh, but nevertheless, it was published. It is, a, <laughs> it is a publication. And it was around about this time that a near neighbor of mine, the Nobel Prize winning uh, author, William Golding, who incidentally was both a physicist as well as an author, a novelist, <coughs> suggested that I call this idea Gaia after the ancient Greek name for the goddess of the earth. And I didn't realize what trouble Bill was putting him into by that suggestion. But, uh, well, it happened, and that was it. And the first paper with Gaia in the title was given at a Gordon conference on in atmospheric science in 1970 and published in Atmospheric Environment in 72. My last encounter with NASA and JPL were in connection with the Viking landers on uh, Mars. And I'm the proud possessor of three certificates of recognition from NASA for inventions that made possible the GCMS experiment that le le is there on Mars. And it gives me a great deal of pride and pleasure to look up into the sky on a clear, clear night and see Mars and know that something of me is sitting there in, in, in the deserts. Now, I first met Lynn uh, at an Origin of Life meeting, and I can't quite remember the date. I don't have any re record of it, but she would probably know. Um, I would think it was about 1969. Um, and now, I was a very junior member, and they wouldn't take notice of anything I said. Uh, and Lynn was rapporteur, uh, I think that's correct, of the meeting, so she couldn't intervene very much. So it wasn't all that effective a meeting. The grandees uh, took the floor. Um, uh, so we didn't discuss uh, Guy or any of those things at that meeting. Um, but in 1971, I think it was, I first went to Boston, uh, to Lynn's lab, uh, because she wanted to talk to me about the role of atmospheric oxygen in the atmosphere. And we soon began an intense collaboration on the Gaia hypothesis. Lynn brought to the hypothesis her deep insight as a bio biologist, especially uh, about the crucial role of microorganisms. Now, as I'd mentioned, I'd been trained as a bacteriologist and, and spent years in medical research and had worked actually on the transfer of infectious diseases. Lynn soon showed me how in the real, the planetary world, human pathogens are almost insignificant and that the Earth had been for billions of years the home for microorganisms alone and that they formed its vital infrastructure. It would be fair to say that uh, she put flesh on the bare bones of my physiological concept of a living planet. We published joint papers in 1973, one in the Swedish meteorological journal, TELUS, uh, that expressed my view of Gaia, and the other in geosciences, was it? I think so, it was. Uh, Icarus, Icarus. In Icarus, yeah, expressing Linz. 
uh, up until the mid-70s, the Gaia hypothesis was well accepted by space and atmospheric scientists. There were no quarrels about it then. But soon, both Earth and life scientists began to attack. At first, the criticisms were helpful. But when the neo-Darwinist biologists, who were a kind of, you might call them fundamentalist biologists, they behave in many ways as the fundamentalist religious do. Not surprisingly, Richard Dawkins is one of their chief proponents. Once they got into the act, then it became pretty rough. And uh, I think Di Gaia was really thrown into the dustbin as far as um, scientific quarters were going. Uh, some of their arguments made quite a lot of sense. They just said more or less there is just no way for living organisms to regulate a planet. They can't regulate anything beyond their phenotypes. Um, uh, this forced me into the position of answering them by making a model, a simple one called Daisy World, showing that, yes, in a way they were right. Life didn't regulate the planet. It was the whole system of life and its inorganic components that regulated itself. In other words, the whole darn shooting match was a, was a system that was capable of self-regulation. Um, anyway, Daisy World works very well, and uh, they've been found a real evidence from the Earth that it is self-regulating. And this is what led to Gaia theory, or as it's more commonly called, Earth system science. So despite, num and despite numerous attempts, it has not been falsified, and soon I'm told it will be used in my country, in the large climate models at the UK's Hadley Centre, uh, as part of the IPC's predictions of future climates. By taking a top-down, a telescopic view of biology, instead of the Earth-based view through a microscope, NASA exobiologists have led to the founding of the, this new discipline, Earth system science and perhaps planetary system science of which Gaia is an important part. Lynn and I owe an enormous debt to NASA for, for having provided us with the opportunity to take a step beyond Darwin and recognize that evolution by natural selection is a property of the whole planet, not just of the organisms alone. And this coupled evolution enables the Earth to regulate its climate and composition uh, with the goal of sustaining habitability. And its full understanding will probably be vital if we're fully to understand climate change and how to cope with it. Thank you. Please address the audience. Thank you, James.